we go. Okay. Welcome to another episode of the Guest Safety Officer. Um, I'm here myself by myself this week. I'm afraid Ian's had to leave the show today, or I've kicked him off the show because I was contractually obliged to today. He was just wasn't he in. It wasn't in. Anyway, I've got an exciting show for you today. I'm just going to introduce myself. I'm Gary Twining Wright. I've been in the industry for 37 years, doing all sorts of security from retail to nightclub security to event security to close protection to hostile to training. Um, and as I always say, I've never done cyber security in my bag. But today I've got a very special guest with me, Gary Ross. Uh, Gary, please introduce yourself. Well, thanks very much indeed for the opportunity to be here, Gary and Ian, even though he's not here. Um, so, as you said, my name's Gary Ross. Um, like you, I've been in the sector now 44 plus years, so I'm getting on a wee bit. Um, first 12 years after I left college was to join the Army. I served for 12 years at the Royal Military Police. Uh, so, yes, for those of you out there, ex-servicemen, I'm an ex-monkey. Um, having left the Armed Forces, done a number of things within there, uh, both general police duties and some specific tasks I won't bore you with. I ended up going into the retail sector, security, uh, and I joined Harrods. Um, I spent the next 20 years working at Harrods within the security directorate there. Uh, the first 10 operationally on the ground, worked my way up through the management stream, um, and then got an opportunity to apply for a new position that was being uh, put in place, which was to set up and run uh, the security directorate training office. Uh, I was successful and set that up and ran it for 10 years. Um, in 2009, I decided to need a career change, um, and I ended up switching from retail to the healthcare sector, and I joined the NHS as what's known or was known in those days as a local security management specialist or LSMS. Um, interesting role, fascinating role. Um, basically, you're the NHS criminal investigations wing um, and deal with all crime other than fraud, bribery and corruption. But you're also a specialist in looking after people in the sense of violence reduction. And for the last 14 years, I've performed that in a number of acute trusts as opposed to mental health, uh, where I have been an NHS criminal investigator and violence reduction training specialist. Oh, th thank you, Gary. Well, one of the reasons I brought you here, because I know that you do specialise in the handcuffing. And this is what we're actually talking about or the topic we've discussed today is one of the things that actually really grinds my gears. I see it on links in the head a lot. Uh, we, we see that. Someone will put a picture of some pink fluffy handcuffs up and, um, you know, you get the scenario where they, they, they state that these are the only handcuffs a security officer or, or, or a nighttime economy or a guest safety officer will ever require. And I always find these people, they've never been frontline. They've never mm -hmm. been frontline. They've never dealt with people on that working in either an event or a nightclub or even, you know, the ED, the emergency department, where someone is coming in and being extremely violent and they have a very narrow minded view of, of the use of cuffing so so the first first question i'm going to sort of throw to you is they can, can you give some scenarios i mean from your experience working in the ed and business pieces what, what, why and when would you would you prefer to use cuffs um I, i'll answer it directly but i'll also start generically as well if that's all right there's a couple of things uh, i should mention first and foremost um the use of mechanical restraints and we, obviously we're set using the word handcuffs but we use a range of mechanical restraint systems within the acute sector and, and the acute hospital in which I work. Um, why? Because it's not one size fits all. Um, every tool is there for a purpose and some tools will fit multiple purposes, but sometimes you need a range of tools to enable you to do the job as effectively, safely as possible. Uh, and within the context of where I work, we use rigid handcuffs. Every officer is trained and equipped uh, and wears them as a matter of course on his daily duties. But we've also got a wider range of mechanical restraints that we use from soft cuffs, leg straps, um, safer handling belts, um, safe belt systems, as well as going down to uh, the UK safety pod system, which is a safer pod. It's something to mitigate the effects of ground and floor restraint. Um, but the other issue is at the beginning of every training session we do with the security team and doctors and nurses throughout the hospital when we train them in restraint and or breakaway is we put three acronyms up on the board. It's the first slide up there. It's on a whiteboard, what have you. And I think it will be useful for your colleagues out there to factor it in because it also answers the question you've asked. And those are three acronyms, CDA, AHC and JYA. And they stand for Circumstances Dictate Actions. And we drill it into our officers and everybody that what you face in front of you will determine how you act. 
there's no point going in with a preconceived notion. You may have got good information, you may have got bad information, but that will determine what you're going to deal with when you get to it and come face to face with the problem. AHC, actions have consequences. Now, hopefully it's a good consequence um, and it doesn't go wrong, but there is going to be a consequence and the individuals, be it the use of handcuffs or otherwise physical restraint, need to understand and appreciate that. Um, and finally, and probably most importantly, JYA, justify your actions. You have to be able to explain to someone, it could be your line manager, it could be an event organiser, it could be the club owner, God forbid it's the police, what you did and why you did it. And more importantly, you need to do that within its legal context. Because notwithstanding anything else, if you can't do that, you're leaving the potential that even though what you did was right and correct and legally appropriate, that you've just taught yourself in a world of trouble. And in my 44 plus years of experience, I've said this many times, I've seen more people talk themselves into trouble than have ever managed to talk themselves out of it. So what you face and what is understood that you're likely to face by virtue of proper risk assessments, training needs analysis, will determine the type of equipment that you would need to minimise and mitigate the risks that you're likely to face. Now, as I've said, within the context of the hospital in the acute sector that I work in, the, the officers carry a range of equipment on their belts. So they'll carry a set of rigid cuffs, they'll sorry, carry a set of soft cuffs, and they'll carry a set of leg straps and have access to a wider range of larger, shall we put it that way, larger restraint equipment that they could use. Um, the scenarios that we're likely to face with, well, you know, as we said off camera before, the problem that we face in the acute sector of healthcare is you do not know what is walking in the door on any given day, at any time of the day. It could be somebody that's just been involved in a road traffic collision. They've had a minor accident at home, drugs overdose, alcohol, uh, brain infarction, contagion. You just haven't got a clue. So you get a wide variety, both in age uh, and sex, of individuals walking in the door, some with relatively minor issues, but it concerns them greatly. Um, we call them the, the, the worried well uh, who walk in the door who think it's a major catastrophe when actually it's a minor issue, to people who are very, very badly hurt, injured or sick, and many times have absolutely no understanding or control over what they're doing. Um, and I would equate the difference between somebody who's hiked up on drugs, self-taken drugs, uh, illicit drugs, um, with somebody that suffered a bad head injury. The chances are they're just as likely to be highly volatile, uh, but one of it's self-inflicted, the other's not. So the officers on duty simply don't know and have to be prepared for a massive range of issues. The other problem that we've got because of our physical location, and for those who don't know, I work at, or certainly part-time now, full-time, at King's College Hospital, whose catchment areas, Brixton, Peckham, Peckham Rye, Camberwell, is there is a huge gang-related issues there. King's is also a major trauma unit. It's one of London's four major trauma units. So our catchment area extends beyond just the local uh, area and expands out to everything the Kent side of the Dartford Tunnel along the south coast, so Kent, Surrey, Sussex. So we've got a six and a half million person catchment area for major trauma. Now, these are people, gunshot wounds, knife wounds, uh, major road traffic collisions, other major injuries that have been caused through major trauma. And again, you haven't got a clue what's coming in that door until it gets there. So you have to be resolved, prepared, trained and equipped to deal with that whole range of issues. And handcuffs for us, based on our experience and provable, via one, the incidents have occurred previously and our risk assessment is a necessary tool. I, I have to agree with you. I mean, I'm, I mean, as I said to you earlier on, I mean, the, the times in the nighttime economy, we've, or, I've, or the company or the people I've worked with over the years, we've used, actually had to use mechanical restraints. It's probably about 20 times in 37 years. I mean, you do get guys and girls out there who, who are handcuff happy. You know, but yes. you're, you're always going to get these type of people. But going back to when I was working in the mental health side, we were using restraints near enough every other day for mm. a fresh, and and that's it. It was a different environment, a very different mm. environment. 
but but going back onto as you say when people walk into the acute area you don't know what you're walking to and it's the same as walking into a nightclub these guys and girls out on the ground these people they don't know what what's going to happen yeah. and um I'm, i remember put something up in linkedin recently and everyone was you had the the naysayers you can't be doing this and what have you and then i gave the background of this general we had to restrain he'd already sexually assaulted two females he was out on license from the police he was tagged yeah and he'd already committed an assault and he had to be restrained and we had to be cuffed and everyone started saying oh we see your point now we see your point and working in that nighttime environment you you do you do you deal with a lot of violence sometimes the same as you would do in the ed department or the acute, acute area um so i know exactly where you're coming from and as i say it's the naysayers who don't quite understand this i mean this this brings me to my next question really i mean what what training would you recommend Ah, training. Um, so again, it's not just the training in hand. You can train somebody technically and mechanically how to use a set of handcuffs or any other mechanical restraint in the same way that you can with a uh, physical restraint. Um, but it's a greater issue than that. Um, depending on the sector the person's working in, I would argue that what they need is a robust understanding of all the legal issues that apply to that particular area because they change. So, for instance, you, you'll hear it be said that, you know, um, most security officers do not have a power to detain. Uh, you've either got to arrest somebody or not, and then you need to understand the law as it applies to arrest. Well, that doesn't necessarily apply in the healthcare sector. There are lawful powers to detain there. So within the regime that we supply our officers, we give them, and I hate using management speak, but an holistic training uh, regime. So they have fundamentals based on a, an online course that they get uh, done over three months, which will give them a basic understanding of the environment, the sector, and everything that applies to that. We go more in depth with classroom face-to-face -face training with their legal requirements. So they understand, and again, I'm gonna use acronyms here, what we call LATD, Lawful Authority to Detain, as well as LATR, Lawful Authority to Restrain, because they are different, uh, training around use of force, as well as a four day physical intervention course um, and a one day mechanical restraint course off the back of it. And then that is an annual training requirement going forward. It's two day refresher as opposed to five days, but they get an annual refresher. Also, what we do is we have four teams uh, of officers that work the shifts. Every team will have its own individual uh, BTEC level three handcuffing instructor and restraint instructor on the shift. And they would be expected on a regular basis to do micro teaching sessions with their officers um, in relation to all areas, but specifically in relation to physical restraint and handcuffing. So part of the protocol and the regime that we have, and it, as I said, it's an all encompassing regime, is the guys will have their cuffs and their restraint equipment checked at the beginning of every shift, uh, sometimes at the end of it as well, depending on the circumstances. And they can expect to do during the course of a day or a night shift, uh, either the beginning, the end or sometimes in between little micro sessions on updates to any legislation and the actual mechanical use of the restraint systems. Uh, the officer, the training officer will check them out, make sure uh, they're in good nick, that there's no shortfalls anywhere. And if there is, and off the back of incidents that we face, we can then build that into the training regime. Uh, the other thing I would say, and again, it's it's off topic, but it's not, is I've been responsible for overseeing the introduction of body cams at both the acute trusts that I've worked at. And I would argue, uh, based on experience, that the use of body cams and the use of mechanical strengths go hand in hand, no pun intended, uh, in that it is a superb mechanism to mitigate allegations of misconduct. Uh, as well as to utilise it to see that what's being done is being done legally, appropriately and effectively. Uh, and as a training programme, we build that into the training regime that we've got, not just using fixed cameras, but also body cam footage to illustrate points. And it's not there to ridicule or pick on people or to pick fault. It's there to illustrate how we can change and amend. And the reason I say that is, and it may be part of future questions, but I'll answer it now, is we're seeing a greater emphasis and increase both by the courts the police and other regulatory authorities um, that in the event of an incident occurring they are requesting sometimes demanding that we provide them with our training program that we use 
um, our training records as part of it and any training programs that we use and or other methodology or systems we've got in place. So we've got ops manuals, um, uh, health and safety checks. We've got um, risk assessments. All of those are being requested up to and including by the court. And we will provide them because uh, we're quite open about it. We're not trying to hide anything. That needs to be, as well as the specific restraint policy in which the hand companies, that needs to be part of that holistic approach to the training. So first and foremost, if any organization is looking to get their people trained, they're going to have to do their uh, due diligence and see who they think the most appropriate training organization. Are. Now, I could name a couple. Uh, I don't want to be accused of bias in any way, shape or form. Um, but the number of competent, capable organizations that can provide that, I would argue, is relatively small. In fact, I'd say it's tiny uh, based on my experience. So you need to go to a reputable training provider, get the training in, and then not think, well, that's it. Once they've been training on how to use course, we don't have to bother about it for another year and it's done and dusted. You need to build a whole regime about that, including the reporting mechanisms off the back end of it. How do you report? What do you report? Who assesses it? Who looks at it? Um, again, as I've said, I see more people talk themselves into trouble than have ever talked themselves out of it. If you've not got the ability within those officers and individuals, not just to use the equipment, to be able to explain what they did verbally or in writing, then you've got a potential major liability for your organisation. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I mean, if, if we're taking it away from, um, say, the, the the health environment and we're looking at the nighttime economy, there, there's so many training providers out there who, who give a one day certificate of attendance. And there's lots of these these boys and girls and people running around there with these, with these little tickets. They're waving around. Oh, I've got handcuffing. I've got handcuffing. Then then the training is pretty poor. I've seen some of it. I can, so I'm not going to mention other people think bits and pieces. But there's, there's there's people out there running around with these tickets and they think that's it. The bill and end all. I've got, it's I've got, scary. I, I came is. across, um, I mean, some people who don't work in the healthcare sector might not be aware of it. There's a thing known as secure ambulances. They're not run by the ambulance service on the whole. They're private companies and they provide what is akin to um, police vehicles. They're ambulances, but they've got cells in there and it's to move highly volatile patients betwixt and between various locations. It could be mental health into acute or vice versa. You'll find that all of those individuals working on those ambulances carry handcuffs as part and parcel of their equipment. I was speaking to one organization and we we're just discussing the training side. I said, well, what training? Because they approached me, said, oh, could you give us some more training? I said, well, I'm not being funny. That should be coming from your senior management, from your employer. Those are the ones responsible. I said, yeah, we can do it. But, you know, there's going to be a cost implication. To it. Um, and I said, why? What do you get at the moment? And considering the nature of the clientele that they're dealing with, the only reason they're going to be called is because this person poses a potential high risk, either to themselves or to others. Um, then they got uh, three hours of restraint training and half an hour on handcuffs. And I just went, sorry, run that past me again. I said, you're joking, aren't you? So that must be your prelim. And went, no, 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 that's it. I said, well, how often do you retrain on this? No, no, we get it once at the beginning of our time with the organizer. And that. I said, have your bosses got any understanding and appreciation the potential liability, not just for you, but for them under health and safety legislation and where that could lead them to. And they hadn't got a clue. I, I go back to what I said before. The biggest problem most people, the likes of us, will face is educating senior management, not the people working at the coalface. Well, they understand the risks. They understand the issues. They know what they need. It's the people further up the food chain that for whatever reason, and some of them are, are well-founded, you know, it's perfectly um, appropriate response they've got. But I would argue, and I don't mean this in a nasty way, they are ignorant of the reality. Uh, and that leads to bigger problems. Exactly right. I mean, as I say, we look at, we look at both sides of this coin here. And again, I've, I've, I've come across that myself. But your individuals on the ground, if we just look at a basic security officer or your, your door supervisor, I guess, safety officer, you know, they've got this ticket and they, they, they never train again. They will mm. never train again. They've got this ticket. And, you know, I've, I've had these people come up to me and I go, I'm, I'm a response officer. I've got a handcuffing certificate. And you look at it and go, you've attended this course, you know, you've just attended a course. You haven't got a certificate. And there's companies out there for now and they're not doing refresher training. They're not doing anything like that. But they think they've got these skills. And some of them are damn well dangerous. 
you know, and this is why I do get the point when people turn around and say, you know, these are the only cuffs the security ever have, pink fluffy ones. Yeah, they have a point. But, you know, the real point is it fall, always falls back onto training. You know, these people who've got the certificate of attendance and even people who do these transfers, if they're not doing the proper training, they should be carrying, they should be carrying cuffs. You no. know, they, they start becoming that liability. Um, you know, I mean, what, what legal implications? You know, we're walking into those situations. You started mentioning it. What oh, legal massive, legal massive. Um, it, it, you know, as, as I've explained before, from a legal perspective, there, there's really two. It could be civil, it could be criminal. Um, for those that are not aware of it, the authority, legal authority, because there's two different authorities required. One is by your organisation to give you permission to utilise them uh, because they can restrict or uh, refuse that. And we face this all the time in the healthcare sector. And I've no doubt they do in the entertainment. I certainly saw it in the retail sector 20 years. We weren't allowed to carry cuffs there. Um, although there's many occasions when we could have put them to good use. Um, so you need that authority from the organization. From a legal perspective, um, the authority to carry and utilize them is a common law use of force option. Um, the same law that applies to police applies to any other private citizen, be they in security sector or not, about the carriage and use of handcuffs. It's no different. There's no special law that applies to police, uh, as there is in many other areas when it comes to weapon systems, that wouldn't apply to security officers or security personnel. The law in relation to handcuffs or any form of mechanical strength is exactly the same. Um, so you need to have that authority to carry from both areas. When it comes to them, how do you support that? I go back to one of the things before about justifying your actions. It's not just a case of the individual officer justifying their actions. The organization or organizations have to be able to justify their use as well. I would argue that's based on a robust review of previous issues and incidents, if they're available, uh, a good sound risk assessment of the situations and the scenarios you're gonna put people in to have an understanding of it. So for instance, if it's a, I don't know, um, a nightclub venue, well, one of the things you're gonna factor in is people are gonna be drinking alcohol and potentially using illicit drugs. Is that going to increase or decrease the risk? Well, anybody with an ounce of common sense or any experience knows it's going to increase the risk. Uh, you see them at the club end, we see them when it goes wrong and they end up in the ED. Um, if it is a, I don't know, uh, a concert, a show, that may still apply. So what mechanisms have you got in place? You need to understand the risk and that should form the foundation of any decision-making process that you've got. Off the back of that, you then look at, okay, do we need everybody to be equipped with this if we think it is appropriate or do we need a response team? An individual officer on his own with a set of cuffs, any form of restraint involves more than two individuals, sorry, more than one individual, it's at least two. Uh, and I would argue it's the same with the use of cuffs. Yes, you've got them. And in a dire emergency, could you attempt or try to put them on on your own? Yeah, but the chances are you and they are gonna get hurt badly before that happens. In order to put cuffs on, there are people that are fully compliant, but a lot of the times there is a lack of compliance. You've got to gain control, physical control of the individual before it's safe to get them on. Uh, as far as the legal aspects of concern, as I said, civil law, so the individual, if he thinks it's been inappropriate, either the application or they've suffered an injury off the back of their application, could then go out and sue you individually and through you, your employer, um, and push comes to shove, they could also make a complaint to the police and there's a potential for criminal charges, for false imprisonment, for assault, depending on the nature of the injury, aggravated assault et al. Which again reinforces what I said before, just training somebody, the mechanics of how to put the set of handcuffs on and take them off is one thing. It needs to be a robust training regime that explains the legal implications and aspects of it to enable that officer one, to use them lawfully, and secondly, to be explained, to explain his actions and behaviour afterwards. I, I fully agree. It's, it's got to be that point, and people do need to understand. Again, as I said previously, it always falls back on the training, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. People haven't got the correct training, they haven't got the understanding of the skills, they haven't got the legal knowledge. You know, it, it's, 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 a, it's, it's bound to fail, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. bound to fail. And, and the thing about it is this, you know, as I say, it's still frightening. There's people out there, is still running around with a ticket. 
But some of these individuals, just the, the training providers I'm talking about now, all they're yeah. interested in is their bottom line. They get the money in, it's fire and forget. You know, we've given the training. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye bye. I and I've seen it. It's starting to happen uh, increasingly. And I would like to see it more in the when a situation does develop and it does end up. And my primary experience is with criminal courts. Um, when you get defence counsels um, turning around and demanding to see your training programmes, the officers to explain what training, because I've been in court when this has happened, explain the nature and the level of training, the frequency of training that they've been provided. Um, to explain how many incidents they've been involved in the, the last X number of years that meant they've applied handcuffs, has there been any um, outcomes, negative outcomes as a result of that? Now, that might not be relevant to the case in point, but all it's trying to do is set a picture for the judge and or jury to set you in a negative light. If officers and organisations are not prepared for that, are not equipped for that, are not capable of dealing with that, um, then they've got a major problem on their hands or potential major issue. This brings me to my next question. I mean, OK, so we've, we've now restrained someone, you know. How are we looking after that as individuals when we are restraining them? Yeah. So, again, it would it would be drilled in at the training stage. Uh, and we face this all the time. And we uh, part of my job now that I've gone part time the last couple of years uh, and I'm still there on the books at King's to help and assist and support the guy that I train to take over from me, is I do a lot of research. Uh, I'm looking at cases all the time with the help of some very, very, very well-known and competent individuals that are out there. So you look at the issues associated with um, forms of restraint, including the use of, and we're not going to disassociate it with it because the chances are if you've got them in a set of handcuffs, for instance, they're going to be physically restrained on top of that as well. Um, you need to understand the mechanics and the processes involved that could lead to something going wrong. Uh, so you need to understand the issues associated with positional asphyxia, other conditions out there like acute behavioural disorder, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, we have an advantage within the healthcare sector in that, guess what, that's what we're there to do. So we've got highly qualified trained personnel who are trained to deal with medical emergencies. But the individual individuals need to be trained in understanding and at least at a basic level assessing the medical condition of the individual involved we work on a, a basic principle uh, mechanical restraints you know and as i said we use a range of them are there as an aid uh, the advantage i would argue for say rigid handcuffs over other forms of handcuffs metal handcuffs as well as soft restraints is the speed of application and therefore the speed of control that can be gained but once you have got control, it's drilling into the offices to get that person, regardless of who they are, into a safe position as rapidly as you can, whilst continuing to monitor as best you can, given the knowledge and uh, resources you have available. Now, one of the things that we do at King's, and it's written into our policy, is that any physical restraints, mechanical restraints, we want a member of staff there, a medically trained member of staff there. And you think, well, that's blatantly obvious. Well, a lot of our issues, violence issues, occur within our emergency department, though it occurs across the whole of the footprint of the trust. Um, strangely enough, nurses and doctors are not trained in first aid. They're very highly qualified and trained, but they're not first aiders. But we want somebody there that's going to monitor that individual because we're concentrating on other things. And I'll give you one very, very quick example. We had a, a patient come in a number of years ago, and we were fortunate to capture all of this on camera, uh, both body cam and fixed camera footage. A guy who had been released from a mental health hospital the day before, he'd self-harmed uh, within the next 24 hours. He actually stabbed himself in the chest seven times, was brought in and was under police guard on a 136 in the ED. He waited until the police officers were distracted. He reached over because he's in a resource bay and within a resource bay, he got lots of equipment, including trolleys full of toys and tools, including scalpels. And he's waited till they're distracted, reached over, extracted a scalpel out of the tray and watched the officer male officer just was watching him he'd come back and starts to shank himself in the chest and throat male officer goes hands-on female officer goes hands-on this guy was a big big lump um and more importantly and this again it's something you need to factor into your training is the guy stark naked covered in sweat and covered in blood well it's bad enough trying to get hold of somebody and restrain somebody and handcuff them when they're drying in clothing you think about it when they've got no clothing on they are covered in multiple bodily fluids, which makes you feel like a bar of soap. All right. 
and they couldn't control him. Medical staff intervened, they couldn't, we got called in and my guys went in and the guy ends up, as most of these things do, whether you want it to or not, on the floor. And I then turned up, got control of the situation, assessed what was going on, and I actually used the police officer's cuffs to cuff the guy up. Um, and then I got everybody off as fast as I possibly could, because with bodies piled on, the more bodies that are involved, the longer it goes on, the more dangerous it becomes, which is what the main ethos of using a mechanical restraint is. You can reduce and remove a number of individuals and still retain safe control of that person. And one of the things you was know, shown on the camera I did was get hold of one of the doctors because I was conversing with a guy and he was talking back to me and then he started to fade. And I said to the doctor, I said, you need to monitor him now while I've got him. I brought him on his side um, and the doctor said, crack, and the guy crashed and we had to get him on the trolley and they had to work on him. Now, fortunately, he, he survived and lived. Um, but the two important lessons for me from that was, one, initially, too many chiefs and not enough Indians. Nobody took control. Uh, and I'm not having a pop at the police officers. One was a probationer, the female was a probationary officer, and the male officer hadn't got a lot of time in. And you could see from the, we saw it on the camera, the looks in their faces, they're literally in shell shock. Um, and the second one, urgent medical assistance. Get somebody that knows what they're doing, knows how to monitor, take vitals, et cetera, to do that. Because the guy turned around and she said, he's crashing. Now, he could recognise that from his experience and knowledge and got it there. So I would argue that if you're at a venue, and I know it's not easy, say, in a club, but certainly at a football ground or um, a, uh, a concert, your security team need to work very closely and work out protocols with your medical personnel that are there, as well as having basic skills themselves in relation to it. But understanding the issues associated with prolonged restraint, with prone restraint, and the other medical issues is an imperative, I would argue. I've, I've got 100% agree with you uh, on that, it's totally. I um, mean, you know, taking myself away from the situation, working for the people I work with, um, a lot of the guys I work with are medically trained now. They're either ECA, first responders, or EMTs, but they're, they're working the security. And they've got that knowledge in school. But yes. again, in, it's one of the most important things is people who've got these tickets they don't understand no. what they're doing and it is it's so, so dangerous that you know they're involved in, in restraint and they don't understand they're not looking after you know they say the patient the customer the service user um and they, they've got to understand the awareness and effects of what's going on mm -hmm. um one of the things you did bring up there at the point as well is at the end of the day the idea of using mechanical restraints is re is meant to reduce the amount of yes. restraint use at the time yes. which is very important. I mean, I mean let, let's face it to, to restrain I've, I've been there with 10 people to restrain one person and then suddenly we get some cuffs on them and then it's one-on-one -on -one. it makes life mm -hmm. a lot easier we've got control of the situation we can de-escalate everything and you've got that person sitting there nicely either you know front stack rear stack whichever which mm -hmm. has occurred but it's now reduced that whole time because i've, I've been like yourself involved with restraints where they've gone on for too long you know, we've got five people involved. I've been in the, the healthcare side. I've been on, on the event side where we've got big units, guys six foot five, and there's 10 of us holding the guy down and he's lifting people up and throwing them off. But again, we, we've we've controlled the situation. Once we've got them cuffed, suddenly the whole thing has been de-escalated. And now it's one-on-one -on -one and the rest of the team's safe. That person is safe. And But again, you always get the nays out. Oh, why'd you do that? Just, you get it all the time, yeah. unfortunately. And again, it, it stems from ignorance in its generic sense, so a, a lack of appreciation, understanding of the risks involved. It is, it is somewhat, when you explain this to them, and I've had heated debates with some very senior people across various uh, mental health, safeguarding. Um, one is to get them out of this concept, which is hardwired into some, not all, but into some of them. Uh, the, the minute you mention restraint of any variety, physical, mechanical, they immediately in their minds equate that with abuse. I, I see it in their faces and I've had it said to me, that's abuse if you can't do that. Um, I wouldn't quote medical knowledge at them. I don't expect them to quote legal concepts at me because they simply don't know them. When I get people turning around and said, that's illegal, you can't do that. I went, really? Would you like to explain to me in explicit detail where you're saying that's illegal um, or unlawful? Um, but it's getting them to understand that this piece of equipment is designed to be used to reduce risk. It seems an oxymoron to them when you point that out to them and explain what the methodology is. But 
and it's not just big individuals. If you've ever seen individuals on cocaine range, which leads partially to ABD, verbal disorder, I helped three police officers and myself to restrain a, she must have been no more than five foot and about seven and a half, eight stone dripping wet through. And she was bouncing all four of us, including herself, off the floor because of the stimulants that were trafficking through her system. Uh, again, a, an area that's unique to us, the number of times we get called up to theatres recovery to deal with issues there. You've got somebody coming out from under general anaesthetic. One, they don't know what universe they're in, let alone what planet they're on. And I've got no idea what they're doing and sometimes got show immense strength. And again, naked, bodily fluids, they're ripping lines out, tubes out. It is a visceral environment. You've got to be able to gain rapid control in order to minimise and mitigate the risk that person poses both to themselves as well as potentially to others. And that's the nub. Now, the legal framework will provide you with the authority to do it, when to do it, when not to. There'll be occasions when you say, no, it's not worth it or it's not feasible. We recently had a situation where we had to daisy chain somebody rear uh, to the rear and it was a quadruple daisy chain. They were that big, four sets of cuffs on them. Um, because they were huge, and, I, and, and I've got some big lumps, or got, there's still some big lumps work on the security team at King's, and even they were amazed at the size of this bloke, um, but a set of four cuffs, you know. Now, one thing I would say is, as, as I previously mentioned, we don't just use handcuffs, and we use a range of equipment, and one of the things that we find, and it may be applicable to uh, the sectors that you work in as well, is we de-escalate or can de-escalate coming down the range. So for instance, we get the police bring a patient in on a 136, they're cuffed up, strapped up, whatever it is. Police hand them over and decide it's time for them to leave. They're not gonna leave their cuffs with us, first and foremost, they're gonna take their equipment with them. And we have to have a methodology for doing a handover, a safe handover. And it may well be, we call it clipping them up. So we may well then clip them up off the back of what's happened. If that patient starts to de-escalate, we don't go from nothing, or from something to nothing straight up. We may do, depends on the circumstances. But there are occasions where as it starts to come down, we'll take off the rigids and replace them with a set of soft cuffs or a safer handling system. Now, for those that don't know, it is Doug Miller's equipment at safe handling. It's a big, thick, wide belt that goes loosely around the waist. And there are two single soft cuffs built onto the side. So you can basically lock the hands in to the side. It's an ideal for our type of environment because there's things that may be required to be done to that individual from a medical perspective that mean lines need to go in others. You can't do with rigids on. You can do because it doesn't hinder those procedures from a medical perspective. But what we also find is it starts to bring down the individual. Because having something metal on you is visceral. There is a reaction to it. What we've tend to found, and there has been research being done by the likes of, um, well, Pal Care Shirt, Safer Pods, and has also Doug at Safe Handling, is that people react less viscerally if it's cloth on flesh rather than metal on flesh, if that makes sense. So we use it as a de-escalation technique as well until it's safe for us to then take all the mechanical restraints off. What we found in certain circumstances with certainly with some of our juvenile mental health patients is at the point at which we come to remove all the mechanical restraints, at their request, we've left them on. They said, no, I feel quite comfortable with this and quite safe with this. The thing that we've got to be careful of is to make sure that is noted in the report, because if they're left on for longer than is necessary, it opens you up to legal implications. So making sure that that is, and again, if the body cam's on, you'll hear that and see it. Uh, and the circumstances surrounding it, but also it, we use a thing called Datex, an electronic incident reporting system. It would go in the Datex report narrative as well, that at the request of the patient or service user, the um, safe handling system was left on longer, blah, 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 blah. So it's knowing what to do, knowing how to do it for everybody's safety, and knowing how to report it. That's, that's a good point. I'm glad you brought up these alternatives. Um, you know, we we also carry the soft cuffs, I think, our uh, safe handling, Doug Miller. We've uh, been using them for years. Very good piece of equipment. But, you know, on, on the downside is it, it's OK when someone wants to be compliant, especially in a, in a mental health environment. Again, when we're looking in a, an event or, again, we're looking in a, in a nightclub situation, a bar, we, we don't tend to get compliant people. You tend no. to get people on that, that higher end. Yeah. Whereas, you know, 
a set of rigid, you whisk them out, you've dealt with that situation, bang, 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 and normally you get compliance. Yeah, which yeah there is. I mean, yeah. as like you, I've seen, um, and again, I can think think of any number of incidents. I could bore your uh, listeners to tears, but there's one that strings to mind of a guy that came in, triaged, um, waiting to be seen. And again, when you review the footage, he's pacing and pacing and pacing. Dead giveaways from a non-verbal communication. There's agitation building up. Suddenly starts screaming, shouting, jumping on chairs, um, tries to nut his way into the ED uh, paediatrics department and hit it with such force that it took the door off its runners. And then when he was challenged by the security officer that was on, he pulled out an eight inch ceramic blade out of his left sock. And now we're off to the races. Highly visceral, highly volatile, slicing and dicing himself, threatening others. We managed to contain, control and then restrain the individual safely, still fighting like hell, again, covered in blood, uh, which makes it even more difficult. And that all stopped the split second the armed response team turned up and put the cuffs on. It literally changed split second. Bang. You saw the difference because realisation went out of him. I can't do anything now. Now, don't get me wrong. That's not universal. You'll still get individuals. It'll take a little while before the fight goes out of them. I get that. But on the whole, I would argue, it has a mollifying effect on many people once that is taken away from them. What I would say, there are certain circumstances, and I don't know whether it is unique to our area, where the soft systems is a better option. And I agree with you. You need a certain level of compliance before you can put them on. Although I know Doug, uh, for the benefit, I think it's the Scottish Prison Service, has designed a, a halfway house between rigids and soft cuffs that he's putting out there. And I've got some for training. Um, where we had, again, an individual brought in by the police, cuffed up because she's highly volatile and violent, but she slipped both her wrists. Now, the problem the police faced was the only way to get compliance was to get the cuffs on, but the cuffs are causing further physical damage to her because of the inj self-inflicted injuries she already had. What do you do about that? She's brought into ED, resource. we went in there, and I said to the officers, look, if you're happy... You can take them off and we've got another system that we can put her in. And we've got a level of compliance with her. She started to come down. She'd been given some sedation. And we put her into the safer handling system. And the officers who were due to leave just said, do you mind if we stay on and watch this? Because we've never seen this before. And they hadn't. They're not equipped with it. They didn't know how it worked. Um, and they were quite taken and quite supportive of what they were viewing because of the use of this system. And yes, we still had a control, but there was less possibility now she's in our, uh, under our responsibility for causing further damages to the self-inflicted injuries it sure already caused. The, the funniest side to that is as, as they were leaving, one of the officers turned around to me and said, uh, can I get one of them? I said, well, you'd have to speak to your force officers in real life. He said, no, no, no. He said, I've got a, a six-year-old and a five-year-old. He said, I need them for them. He said, they're a right bloody handful at the moment. And I went, look, I'm not going down that road. <laughs> Whatever floats your boat. Um, but yeah, there, there is equipment that we would have that the police certainly don't uh, in relation to it. And they're quite, and again, the medical staff are very good. And it's, it's not just security. There are hospitals I'm aware of using some of the safer options that clinical staff are trained to use in their environment and use very effectively. And we, I can, I can say with hand on heart, we have saved lives using that equipment in the past. Uh, in the same that we have with the utilization of handcuffs, we have saved lives not taken them, we saved them. And this is what, again, senior management struggle to understand and appreciate until you endeavour to explain it to them. It's, 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 I'm glad you brought that up because my, my next point I want to bring up is, it's like, a, you know, have you faced any legal challenges? I know we covered it a little bit earlier on. I mean, how did you resolve these? I mean, this is a wider picture. I mean, it's, you know, for anyone using cuffs out there, they need to have an understanding you know, you, you said before, having the right risk assessments in places, what have you. But as you're in your position, it could quite easily switch over to a nighttime economy. What legal challenges have, have you guys faced? So, um, again, I've probably said some of this already. So for the sake of repeating myself, first and foremost, you've got to have a robust, uh, holistic regime in place. And what I mean by that, it's not just providing somebody with X amount of training to use this piece of equipment. All right. There needs to be appropriate risk assessments carried out, training needs analysis to determine the level of training that's required by the officers. The risk assessment will, everything stems from it. It will determine what you need to do, how you need to do it, numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you need an appropriate, legally compatible policy 
and procedures that stem from it. We have both a restraint policy. Um, we also have restraint procedures. We've got an SOP manual that deals with officer safety, which covers uh, conflict management. It basically mimics uh, the manual that the police have in relation to that, as well as a separate manual that deals with all the legal aspects of what they can and cannot do. I said before about uh, lawful authority to detain, lawful authority to restrain. There is a training regime that builds around that that they have to have that's both generic, it's part of their induction, uh, it's part of their uh, training, in initial training, and it goes on post that as well. So in order to be able to back off the chat and the use of body cams, I would add that as well. Um, you know, just one stat from my previous trust when I was at UCLH, we'd had them in operationally for a year. I'd overseen a year long um, trial and then we had them in for a year. That last year flagged up the following stats that we saw a 400 percent increase in reports of violence towards staff within RED. Now, it didn't mean there was a 400 percent increase. It just felt staff were more comfortable actually reporting it because they thought something was going to be done. We saw a. 2,250% increase in sanctions being levied by the courts off the back of what the body cam showed. And we actually got inspected off the back of that because our regulator authority was gobsmacked at the increase. And they said that can't possibly be true. And they came in, audited and went, well, yeah, actually it is. And a lot of that was down to the use of the body cams in support of the officers using physical restraint. And we saw a 97% reduction in allegations of misconduct by the officers when they went hands on. Now, it's my understanding that when the Met Police were trialing body cams, they had very similar figures came down the pike from them. The issue being that anybody can make an allegation at any time for any reason. All right. You've got to be able, as I said, justify, you've got to be able to evidence that you didn't do what they claim, however spurious that may seem. So we had a recent incident where the officers were physically escorting a patient from A to B using a technique that they've been taught where there is minimal con physical contact and none of it is near the spine. And yet that person lodged a formal complaint and tried to sue the trust on the fact, of the fact that we had injured his spine. It was through the use of one, more than one individual, multiple witnesses and the body cams that put pay to that allegation. So. They need to understand what they can do, what they can't do, uh, the limitations on what they're allowed to do. You need to have uh, an audit trail that will show that. Um, and you need to be, have the evidence to support it to min min minimise and mitigate any of these issues, either getting to a court or once they get there, being proved to be ac accurate and true. Um, is that a guarantee? No, it's not. But it's the vast, it's the most that any organisation individual can do. I'm a big fan, low tech, all right, because tech can go wrong. Cuffs can go wrong. Cameras can go wrong. Everything can go wrong. I drill into the offices, did throughout the training, and the guy that took over me, Steve, does the same now. First port of call, pocket notebook. Stick some in there. You'd be gobsmacked at how much trouble that has kept me out over the decades I've been doing this. And then you speak to people about it, says, right, let me have a look at your pocket notebook entry. Well, no, it's on the camera. Really? Who's to guarantee that the camera was working? All right, I'm a big fan of them, but it's no guarantee they work 100% of the time. So pocket notebook, and it's drilling that concept into them. Notebook entry, get a statement done as soon as possible. That's different from the Datex or whatever reporting mechanism narrative that you've got. Back it up with body cam footage you've got. Back it up with colleague, et cetera, et cetera. That will go a long way towards removing the possibility of spurious and vexatious complaints and allegations about the misuse of this piece of equipment. Uh, very good points. Very good points, Tony. I mean, I'm, I'm a big advocate of uh, pocket notebook. I mean, previously with Trevor Henry, we spoke about the pocket notebook. Body worn cameras, I've been using them, you know, I've been going on for about now 20 years. Seriously, it's one of the best things which, you know, always down, but always fall back your notebook. But just, just summarising this whole thing up, because I know we're running out of time. I mean, at the end of the day, what, what we're saying is, you know, if you're going to use cuffs, first of all, make sure you're qualified. That's mm -hmm. the main thing. If good qualification provides you, get a good training provide you, right, behind you. Refresh, continuously refresh. Mm -hmm. Make sure the people you're working for have the right policies in place and they've got these things in place to protect you, you know. Um, and 
Have I missed anything out there, Gary? No, and I, th- and I think when it comes to the protection, once, you know, I, I wrote a paper a while back um, that I distributed at their request to a number of colleagues in other trusts around the country because they were going through the same problem. They wanted to bring cuffs in. Um, the, the nature of the risk within their organisation warranted it. Uh, and it was necessary. There was an increased risk through not using them um, and not being having them made available. And we've seen a number of occasions in the past in which Travel, for instance, was one of the expert witnesses where the equipment was available, but because of the restrictions that were placed on uh, authorization to use, they weren't. And that was partially responsible that led to a fatal incident. You know, it's all right having the equipment, but if the, the mechanisms that you've got in place are so obtuse and so opaque, the, you know, you need the chief executive's permission to be able to go hands on or a senior consultant in our area, which was, has been said to us. Oh, before you use them, we need the senior consultant on duty to authorise it. I went, right, fine. That we've got 560 odd senior consultants working in the trust. When are they coming on the handcuffing course? Because the first thing they're going to need to understand. So that's five days of their year. It's going to have to be taken out. And then one day every year. And they go, no, 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 we're not doing that. So, well, in which case they are not authorised legally to be able to make any comments in relation to it. The medical side, yes, but the actual application, legal side of it, mechanics, technical, no. You need to have, and again, I come back to that management phrase, it's horrible, but it is appropriate, that holistic approach to making sure everything is play. And one thing I would say about the training provider, you don't want to choose somebody that's fire and forget. If you go to somebody that shows you how to use cuffs for half a day or a day or one case of one poor bugger, a couple of hours, and then that's the last time you're ever going to speak to them. It's no good to you. You need an organization that will provide you while you're still in day with high levels of understanding, support, be that from um, a technical perspective, from a legal perspective, from experience, whatever it is, that will provide you with that level of information and support that you need. Because it may well be that should an incident go pear-shaped and end up in court, be it civil or criminal, you get asked to produce, I've already said, your training programs. The next port of call, Bay, get your trainer in here. Right, did you teach this technique? If this, the, the court is still not happy or at the behest of the defence counsel or the prosecutor, whoever, the next question may be, get your master trainer in here and they better provide us with some information. With it. You need to be sure in your own mind that the organisation you choose to do that is capable and competent of doing that. Because if not, it's a waste of time, effort, energy and money. That, that is very true words. That is very true words, and I, I, I'm going to call it a day on this point because I think you no just summed, I, I think you just sum the whole up. At the end of the day, if you're going to go and get handcuffed trained, to get a decent trainer behind you, make sure they are a master trainer. Make sure they supply you with the right information, the right tools for the job. And if you are going to use cuffs, you know, have all these things in play. Make sure you've got risk assessments in play. Make sure the company you're working for is trained and qualified and have a fully understanding of it. You know, otherwise, just waving around that little ticket. You're, you're a danger to yourself and anybody else. So at the end of the day, are, are cuffs a safe, you know, are, are they used for a safe, safe restraint? Yes. There you go. They are. And, you know, do, do they do they um, stop people getting injured in bits and pieces on those things with multiple people, multiple people trying to restrain? You know, they, they do. So at the end of the day, you know, once you've managed to de-escalate the situation, use cuffs, and you've got one person on one person rather than two, three, four, five people trying to restrain someone. Just one final or two final things. One, um, they're a tool, like any other tool that can be misused. Um, and you've got to factor that into your considerations, hence the reason you need appropriate training for all the individuals involved. And two, once they're in cuffs, don't relax. Um, I only say this because, again, I've got footage of an incident from a couple of years ago where police have brought an individual in to be treated for some injuries. He was under arrest um, and they left the ED, the emergency department, into the ambulance bay to take him back to Brixton Police Station. Five officers, one guy, front stacked. First guy goes to the back of the van, opens the door up. Second guy gets in the driver's seat. Another one's carrying evidence bags with full, and the other two are having a chat. What does Chummy do? Does a runner. He got away from him. Or he was front stacked, and he still managed. He took to Shanks' pony, and they didn't get him back for five months. So just pay careful consideration. Once somebody is cuffed up doesn't mean the situation is over you've got to factor that into your training and understanding of the officers um it's not resolved until it's resolved great stuff gary thank you very much for your time today really appreciate it it's great knowledge and i hope you've educated people out there uh, especially some of the naysayers and we can um you know 
advance going forward. Advance going forward, as I say. Thanks very much indeed, Gary, for the invite. Much appreciated. I've enjoyed it. You're welcome, my friend. Speak to you soon. All right. Take care, mate.